Hey, well, good morning, church. Morning. Somebody get excited about this weather, first of all. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Also, just excited to be here, excited to celebrate, excited to worship. Hey, will you guys stand as we begin worshiping?
Father, how we've waited for this day. Lord, I thank you for today, for the beautiful weather. I thank you for this church and every, everyone who's here. Lord, how you have blessed us. You are so good. I pray that you would bless our worship, that it would be pleasing to you and bring glory to your name. Would you bless the service? Thank you for your provision. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Get out.
you guys may be seated. Well, good morning. I want to welcome each and every one of you in the strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to a beautiful Sunday morning that God has given us one more chance while we are here on this planet to give God glory and praise and honor. Amen? What a great day to be alive and a great day to be a Christian. It really is. I tell you, there's no better life than living for the Lord. Amen? Uh, I want to invite up our quiz team and Miss Erica, our our quiz directors. And they went to uh, Howell Water's Edge Campgrounds and had a quiz meet yesterday, the last of the season. And they've got some hardware this morning. Wow. All right, so this was our final quiz meet. Here, let's turn it on. Give us a second. Okay, good. All right, so final quiz meet, and probably the closest one, thankfully. Um, like I've told you guys in the past, most of our quiz meets have been like two hours away, so it was nice to have like an hour. And anyone that's been out to the campgrounds knows that it's not um, an amazing day out there unless you go to Tomato Brothers, which we did. So um, it was a great day. Um, At our quiz meet, it covers uh, 20 different lessons, so um, it ends up being, I don't know the exact um, number of questions, but the kids have to know it's around 300, give or take, questions, and they only ask 30. So it's, um, each quiz meet presents its challenges. This one is probably the hardest because because it covers so many uh, lessons, but our team did not disappoint. So... They did very well, and Brenna wanted to share uh, what everyone ended up getting. So, um, uh, Nolan got bronze, and Roman Roman got uh, silver, and Nora got uh, gold with one full round that she cor- uh, answered all correct answers. <laughs> and then George, Silas, me, and Eva got all, all, all stars. So that means that we got all the questions right. Part of the competition as well is um, the uh, each level has an opportunity to do our recite memory verses. So there are 20 as well um, that they have to recite. Now, when they go into the room, it's all at random. So yeah. you draw out of a cup, and you have to say whatever number verse that, that you drew. So they had to pick um, three. And out of all of the red level quizzers yesterday, um, only three were able to recite uh, the verses that they pulled, two in which were from our church, so that's awesome. So that was Miss Eva and Miss Nora. And then Eva, did you wanna share a verse? Okay. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Amen. So pretty, pretty incredible. So um, lastly, another piece of good news from yesterday is uh, there is a regional quiz meet uh, you have to qualify for. So um, that is at Olivet in June. And um, there are five spots that are available for their level. Um, Rochester took four. So, um, so Brenna, Silas, Eva, and George all qualified for regionals. So it was an incredible year for all of our quizzers. We are missing one. We're missing our sweet Audrey up here, but they all did such an amazing job. So make sure that you tell them um, how well they did and that you're proud of them. Of course, we always you know, thank you for your prayers, your support. Um, it means a lot to us. So in the time that the parents and the leaders invest in this. So it's, uh, 
proof that it, it's making a difference in the lives of these, these kids. Amen. And before you guys go, can I just pray with you while you're up here, pray for you? Yeah. Father, thank you for this incredible uh, ministry and these precious lives and these beautiful kids that you've entrusted with us. And thank you for the coaches and parents and leaders that have put this all together. And I pray, God, that uh, your word will never return void. But, God, it would plant itself deep in the hearts of these kids. That they would be encouraged and have something to draw from when the enemy wants to get at them. God, thank you for your word that's a living word that we hide in our hearts for when we need it the most. So God, encourage them, and I pray this will just be one step closer to more knowledge and uh, depth of their faith as they walk with you every step of the way. Bless them now in a great way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Way to go, everyone. Good job, guys. Way to go. Just phenomenal. While they're heading back to Kids Church, I want to remind you that uh, our spring flower sale and maple syrup sale is ongoing, and you have until next Sunday to get those order forms in, and there's forms in the foyer. Yeah, so make sure before you leave today, grab a couple of those and uh, get those in as soon as possible. Uh, all reports are that every, all the flowers that we have purchased throughout the years have been uh, beautiful, lasted for a very long time, and there's nothing really better than some pure maple syrup on your oatmeal in the morning. I'll tell you that right now. Hello. I got a witness out here in the front. I want you to remind you as well that Legacy Events on April 27th, we have a trivia night, um, trivia afternoon with lunch starting at 11 o'clock in the, the morning. It's a Legacy event, but everybody is invited. I am your quiz master. I am already preparing questions for you, so we want you to be a part of that. It's great to get together. It's a great ministry. Also, Women's Retreats happening May 3rd through the 5th at Water's Edge, a campground in Howell, Michigan. The theme is life is a journey, and it certainly is that. And so ladies, make sure you grab a flyer for more information. Sign up today. Uh, and help out the ladies as well if you tell us who you will be rooming with during the weekend. And see Colleen Cleveland and her wonderful team uh, if you have any further questions for that. Now, today is a very special day. You have been told about this, uh, a little bit about what's happening in the life of our church. But before I can talk about what's happening today and tomorrow, I've got to go back to what happened yesterday. Before I can tell you where we're going, I've got to talk a little bit about where we've been. And so if you'll just bear with me uh, as I kind of lay the story out a little bit about our church. It was back in 1999. The congregation had outgrown the old church building that was located across the street at 1520 Walton Boulevard. And so Pastor Crum and the church board then knew that they needed to look at other options. Do they move to two services? Do they look for another church building or do they look for property and build a brand new church building on that property? What happened next is really a true testament to how great God is because Pastor Crum inquired of a realtor as to how much the church property was worth. He was told it was worth about $900,000. Well, Pastor Crum thought that seemed a little bit too low and he felt that God impressing upon his heart that he should list the church property at $1.7 million and just see what God would do. And so that's exactly what he did. And God honored the prayers of the congregation. And the property sold for $1.6 million, which was $700,000 above its reported value. On top of that, the buyer told uh, Pastor Crum that the church could still meet there until they got their new building. And so the search began for a new church home. While looking for land to purchase for the new church building, the church board decided that they wanted to stay close to downtown Rochester, not move further away at the out, toward the outskirts of the town. And so they found a piece of property just down the street at 1799 Walton Boulevard. It was an old apple orchard that had a house and a garage and a barn on the property. And there was yet another hurdle, though, that would have to be overcome because the land was also being looked at by a local developer. And the local developer wanted this property to be zoned as industrial property. But once again, God had gone before the church and the city council voted to keep the zoning as residential land, which paved the way for the Rochester Church of the Nazarene to purchase it and begin building this beautiful church building right here at 1799. 
Pastor Crum would say that it was a whole church effort to get this church built. Many families gave, many sacrificed to make God's vision for our church a reality. A private donor from the congregation felt led by God to donate $60,000 of his own money to add on the kids' church off the gymnasium because he felt that the children needed their own place to worship the Lord. This is a church building planned by God, built by God, and it's even covered in the Word of God. Before the carpet was put down in the building, the whole congregation wrote different scriptures on the floor in their department, covering the floor in God's Word. From kids' church to the kids' wing to the foyer, even right here in the sanctuary, up on the stage, scripture is written right now where you sit, underneath your feet and the carpet. It was on May 5th, 2002, that our church opened its doors for our very first service at our present location. The services were attended by our former Nazarene District Superintendent. The mayor was here and a local congressman who provided a flag that was flown at the state capitol was here. Reverend Crum served as the senior pastor for another 17 years after this church building was built. And so I think it's very appropriate this morning to honor Pastor Crum again and Ruth and their church boards for seeing God's vision and putting in uncountable hours of prayer and kingdom work to get us to where we are located today. Would you give Pastor Crum another round of applause? Amen. We know that God did it, but God accomplished so much through his willing servants, and Pastor Crum was a leader who led with integrity, he led with honor, and he led with godly character. And so we are forever in debt for his leadership of those years. But by 2015, following some very, we'll call them lean years, a turn in the economy took place, and we began to owe now on two different mortgages and we found ourselves over a million dollars in debt. The money was not there to fund our ministries, so every ministry had to rely on fundraising to keep things going. It was a struggle to pay bills from month to month, so much so that your staff felt led to take pay cuts to try and save as much money as possible to keep the lights on while still doing full-time ministry. And for the next Several years, we saw abundant spiritual blessings, personal victories by the members of our congregation, but the church itself struggled financially because of the debt that we owed. In 2017, we re, with a renewed commitment to honoring God and to being good stewards of what God had given us, we launched a debt reduction campaign titled Unleash His Vision with a goal of raising $320,000. It was a three-year effort and although many families gave, they participated, they sacrificed, we did not quite meet our goal. The good news is that we were able to knock a chunk off of our debt, but as, of, as 2019 came to a close, we still owed over $700,000. And then 2020 hit. I was just a few months into my new position as your senior pastor when COVID hit everybody hard. And places of worship were forced to shut down because there was so much unknown. The shutdown forced our church to upgrade our safety measures to be sure, but it also forced us to adapt and move ahead in our technology upgrades. So we started to record services and devotions. We put them online to try to stay connected as a church body. We purchased a new camera and new software to help us with the quality of our online services. If you remember, we had drive through communion. We had several people felt led by God to deliver meals to families to get them through this time. I remember sending out several teams on Mother's Day to many of your homes to make sure that you got flowers. I, I remember I ended up in Grand Blank on that day to make sure that Lynette and Leona got their flowers. We also lost many members from our church family during this time too. And though we could not meet in person for a while, giving increased dramatically. Because of this, we were not only able to continue attacking our debt, but we were able to make upgrades to the church building. 
We painted bathrooms, we painted classrooms and the foyer, we put down some new flooring, we resealed the parking lot, we had insulation installed in several areas, and we had a portion of our roof replaced. Not only that, but we had the pleasure of having our Romanian brothers and sisters use our church for their services and special services, and they have been a tremendous blessing to our church as well. You will not find any more friendly, caring, and godly people than our brothers and sisters from the Romanian church. I promise you that. I felt led of God to open up our gymnasium during this time to our community to provide a place for our youth to gather and stay connected. This led to making several contacts with basketball and volleyball coaches who began to rent out our gym during the week, which provided our church a much needed income and a new network of talented coaches and players. We were one of the first churches, if not the first church, to reopen to begin having in-person services again. And I announced from this very pulpit that as long as I am here, we will never close our doors again because sick people and sinners and saints alike need the church. We've got to remain that lighthouse in the middle of darkness telling this community that there is a place of refuge. There is a place to go. And we'll, we will have our doors open. And because of our decision to reopen, we met a wonderful group of people that were looking for locations to rent for a faith-based homeschool alternative. And so we partnered with High Point Hybrid Academy and Homeschool Connections, who use our building even now, this dur during the week. And I can't re recommend them highly enough to families who are looking for a public school alternative. Hundreds of families have been through our church and our facility. And it's been a joy to have each and every one of them. And through our partnership with the schools, not only have we created another stream of income, but their help, with their help, we have been able to replace another section of our leaky roof. We have updated Kids Church. We've updated the teen room, installed a new gym floor and new hoops, been able to provide families with food and financial assistance. And they are currently spearheading, even now, a donation campaign to help us finish off all of the roof and steeple repairs, update our foyer, and to address our sanctuary lighting system. With all that taking place, it brings us to today. In church, I have in my hands here a copy of our satisfaction of mortgage paper, and I have in my hand here a copy of our term note, letting the bank know we're all, we're all paid up in full. And so I would like to just do this for dramatic effect this morning. Oh. <clears throat> because today, through the goodness and blessing of God and through the generous and sacrificial giving of so many, it's my honor to pronounce the Rochester Nazarene Church as being debt-free. Praise God. <clears throat> and I say to God be the glory for great things he has done. We still have many things to accomplish. And to be very transparent this morning, I want to show you a working list of things that we want to address as we move ahead as a now debt-free church and ministry. We are going to be repairing the upper roof and steeple that will take place hopefully in June or July. We want to address the lighting system and the projectors in our sanctuary and the acoustics because these lights has, have been failing for many years and we don't know how much longer God's going to keep these lights on that we enjoy this morning. We certainly want to update our foyer with new flooring and new furniture, new fixtures, new paint. We've already met with a couple folks that are going to help us with that project. We want to update our bathrooms. I should say an amen from everybody here. Yes. New flooring, sinks, countertops, all the good stuff. We need updates in our bathrooms. We want to look at combining the janitor's closet with that Sunday school room because, praise God, that room is crowded and, and booked. We need more space. That's a great problem to have, by the way, church. We want to look at combining the old library and the room next to it to open up a cafe area for our coffee club that will double as another classroom for teaching. We have two AC units that are down that need to be replaced. 
We want to replace our entry doors, which at this point are now old and out of stock and out of fashion, and put in some new security doors with some keyless locks entries. We have looked around the property. We need some help outside with our landscaping. And we have some lights outside in our parking lot that are out that need to be replaced and fixed. A few honorable mentions. We need to recarpet some rooms. We want to purchase some signage around our church building so people know where to go and buy some nice advertising boards to put in the foyer so we can display all the upcoming events. We want to remodel the fireplace room. We want to update our kitchen. And we want to do something with our church sign because right now it is pretty much out of order. So even 20 years from now, we might still be celebrating 100 years if we don't do something soon. And, and there are still needs uh, to address over at the church parsonage as well. But let me make this one thing very, very clear this morning. Bless you. Even though our church building is showing signs of wear and tear, God did not bless us in such a way just so that we can make his house shine and look new. No, the mission of the church will always be what it has always been, and one of our precious children talked about it already. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very ends of the age. We exist to proclaim to this community that there is hope and there is salvation and there is healing and there is freedom in Jesus Christ. We are committed now more than ever to meet the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of the people around us and to proclaim boldly, without fear or favor, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in this last day. We strive to enhance our current ministries, create new and effective ways to reach the lost, and listen here, we also strive to never again find ourselves in debt. So today, we look back at how far God has brought us, we look at his faithfulness, and we look at the many leaders and laity that have sacrificed, and we say, thank you. But I am convinced and I believe that the best is yet to come. And I'm encouraged and excited for what God has yet in store for his church. And while I do not know exactly what tomorrow holds, I do know this one thing. I know who holds tomorrow. And so today we celebrate the goodness and faithfulness of what the Lord has done. And there were so many who thought, certainly, that is a mountain too high to climb. It's an impossible amount. But we have once again not only been blessed by such faithful givers, but we have been shown how faithful God is and the fact that with man this really was impossible. But with God all things are possible. With that in mind, I do want to ask our ushers to come forward at this time to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father, this morning... My heart is full and overflowing already. There's just something inspirational and powerful to hear our kids quote the Word of God. And then to give a few moments to celebrate what you have done for us. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to honor the faithful that have gone before us and paved the way for us to be here this morning and for the many faithful who are now even seated in this room, who are still dedicated to praying for the lost, for giving of themselves in service of the kingdom, for offering their finances unto you, Lord. And we are in such a better spot this morning to be able to witness to this community and to meet the needs of the people around us and to take care of one another, and we owe everything to you. So we celebrate you today. I pray now as we give that you bless both the gift and the giver, for we give as our act of worship unto you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, amen. May God bless you as you give.
Will you guys stand as we continue to worship?
somebody said a long time ago, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Somebody said, well, that's pretty good, but it's also the sweetest name I know. The more I say it, the sweeter it sounds. And when I'm in trouble, you better believe I'm not calling on Buddha or Muhammad. I'm calling out the name of Jesus because he is alive and well. Father, thank you for this time together. Bless now your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. I want to look this morning for a few moments at the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, verses 1 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 7. The Bible says, Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I intend to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle. You got that right? According to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, also translated strongholds. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Pam. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. If you are not aware of it, if you are not already in the fight, if you are a Christian, you have to understand that even now you are engaged in spiritual warfare. This is not a picnic. It's not tiddlywinks. This is not checkers. There are no do-overs. This is a battlefield. And you cannot fight only until you get tired. You can't fight until it gets too hard. No, you've got to fight until the day that you die. Because we are in a daily life or death struggle. It's good against evil. It's right against wrong. It's God versus Satan. It's the flesh versus the spirit. It's the world against the word. It's carnality against holiness. And if you are not engaged, if you are not fighting on the Lord's side, then you are fighting on Satan's side. Because there is no middle ground. In Matthew 12 and 30, Jesus said, Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Christians do not live by conventional wisdom, nor do we worship a conventional God, and we therefore do not fight our battles with conventional weapons. The cause of Christ is never advanced by carnal actions or by carnal methods or by human effort. Our spiritual weapons, perhaps seen as weak by the world, are more than sufficient to see us through and to defeat the enemy. Because we fight against a wily and conniving foe. Let's be honest this morning. Satan will fool you into believing that you've been in church so long that you are strong enough now to withstand every temptation on your own. But those of us who are honest enough this morning will tell the truth, that will testify with me that no matter how old you are, no matter how much Bible you know, no matter how much you shout on a Sunday morning, no matter how many sermons you've heard, you are no match for the schemes of the enemy in your own strength. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what, where every chink of your armor is. He knows about your Achilles heel. He knows what you struggle with. He knows what will bother you. And at the same time, he knows what will not bother you. A Christian ought to never say to themselves, I'm strong enough on my own. I can handle this by myself. We are reminded today that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan is on the rampage, seemingly more now than ever. It's almost like he can see his time is short. 
It's almost like he knows his days are numbered. It's almost like he can feel the rumbling in the sky. It's almost like he can hear the band warming up and the trumpet players getting ready. It's almost like he can hear the choir starting to sing their scales. It's almost like the sky is brighter today than it's ever been before. I think Satan knows what's about to happen in church. We have got to be ready. Amen? That is why the Word tells us to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But thank God that God's Word also tells us that in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In our opening text, Paul is using irony and sarcasm to strike back at his enemies. The criticism against him has been that he is bold when he's not here in person, but timid when he's here face to face. He's strong when he's writing to us, but when he shows up, he's as humble as a lamb. And so Paul says, now I, Paul, myself, I urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I am, or I who am, meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I'm absent. I ask that when I am present... I need not be bold with you or with confidence with which I intend to be courageous with some of you who regard us as if we are walking according to the flesh. Paul says, I've been, all, I've been at this thing too long. I've been, I've been through too much. I've preached too often to let you draw me into some carnal conflict. I've been walking with the Lord way too long. To let some person like you, who only wants to argue with me, draw me out in the open in the hopes that I might ruin my testimony. Church, you cannot let small-minded people, blinded people, hateful people bring you down to their level. Because Mark Twain said, never argue with a fool. Onlookers may not be able to tell the difference. Oh, is that true today? And in this day and age... All anybody wants to do is argue. People don't want to hear your opinion, although they've asked for it. They just want you to hear their opinion. And if you don't agree with their opinion, you're nothing but a hater. Remember when we could have a conversation with two people of differing opinions, and at the very least we walk away agreeing to disagree? Remember when we could do that? Because, church, when conversation stops, that's where we see violence Hatred and prejudice begin. But they're just not talking to some people. Paul's trying to tell his opposition that your weapons are intimidation and manipulation. But my weapons are prayer and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not let people drag you into an argument when they have no interest in the truth anyway. I've heard it said like this. Don't get into any debate at your job in your school, at lunch, or online, amen, over the word of God, because if people who want to argue with you want to trust Jesus, nothing you can say will stop them. And anything you don't say, it won't make them go any further anyway, because it's not about our wisdom anyway, it's about the Holy Spirit who draws all men to himself. You cannot convince those who are already convinced. And you cannot cause the blind to see with flowery words or inspirational quotes or witty anecdotes. What people need is to experience the life-changing and life-giving power of the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said, And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come as someone superior in speaking ability or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I also was with you in weakness and fear and in great trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. 
when you know the word of God, Satan cannot so easily manipulate you. When you know the word of God, Satan cannot easily intimidate you because you have the power, not only of prayer, but of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power unto salvation for anybody who will believe. And church, to accomplish such a daunting task, we are going to need some spiritual equipment. In Ephesians, Paul who likes to use athletic and military metaphors when he's speaking of those who he believes ought to live a certain way, he reminds us that we are to put on every day the full armor of God so that we can stand up against the wiles and the schemes of the devil. I feel pressed in my spirit to remind you today of the reality of there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is a real heaven and there is a real hell. And the gospel tells us the hell created by God is not meant for you and me. In other words, he didn't create this place because he wants us to go there. That place is reserved for the enemy, the devil, and his demons. God's prepared a better place for you and I and those who will call upon his name. Paul calls us to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, Make sure that we have in our hands the sword of the Spirit. Have our feet in shoes in preparation of the gospel of peace. The belt of truth and the shield of faith so that we can defend ourselves against Satan's fiery darts. And you'll notice that every piece of weaponry that we put on is facing the front of us. In other words, if we turn back or turn around, there's no protection now. And you can't be a coward and fight in this battle. You cannot be timid and fight in this battle. You cannot be apologetic and fight in this battle. You've got to be bold in your assault against sin and against the enemy. There is no retreat in this thing called Christianity. And since we have all the equipment that we need, what does this equ equipment accomplish? What does the gospel have power to do? Listen to me. It has the power to destroy strongholds of arguments. He said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty, not in our education, not mighty in our finances, not mighty in our intellect, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I cannot pull down arguments, and I cannot demolish strongholds in my own wisdom. Because there are people who are unsaved who can run rings around me intellectually. And there are people who are unsaved who have more than me financially, and so I have to rely upon this divine power that comes through the word of God because that power cannot be overwhelmed. In Peter's confession of faith, Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not be able to have power over my church because the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. People will want to try and trap you in conversations where they have no meaning of looking for the truth, they are going to be questioning God's integrity, questioning God's faithfulness, questioning God's goodness, and instead of shrinking back from them and shrugging our shoulders and tucking up our tails and running away, I want you to remember that the gospel has the power to demolish strongholds of satanic arguments. If people ask you, where was God when all this suffering was going on in the world, you tell them God was where he's always been and even was when his son was suffering. He's on his throne, superintending the affairs of men. Where was God during that illness? Where was God during that tragedy? Where was God during that disaster? God is in the same place he's always been, ruling and super ruling over the heavens and the earth. Church, God is never taken by surprise. When stress and trouble come into your life, it doesn't move God off his throne. He hasn't vacated his throne, and he won't. God knows what you're going through. And in his own time, 
He will step right in and take care of your situation. He may not come when you want him, but he will be there right on time because our God is an on-time God. Romans 8.28 reminds us, and we know that in all things, I wish I had a Bible reader up here with me. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let me, let me just be real. I don't always understand what he's doing. And I can't always see where he's going. But I sang it a long time ago, maybe you did too. Where he leads me, I will follow. We love the promise of Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And when we go through difficult times of doubt and fear, we often ask ourselves, how is this supposed to prosper me? How is this supposed to give me a hope and future? And ironically, Jeremiah wrote these words to God's people when they were in exile. And James makes it clear in his book that we will face trials of many kinds. Peter tells us not to be surprised by the trials that come our way. In fact, we were told later to count it joy when we face many trials on account of the Lord. And although they faced many trials, these disciples of Jesus had the bigger picture in mind because they realized that difficult circumstances always present us a new opportunity to know God more. Time and time again, we see Christians then and even now enduring hardships, and they're doing it joyfully. And it's not because they enjoy the pain, but because they believe everything is going to be okay as long as God is in it. They, they may not know when or how, but they trust a God that gives them peace, knowing that God sees beyond our pain. We hope and long for what we consider good things, but God has a hope and a future for great things. Our finite minds cannot fathom the things that God has in store for us in heaven. And we may not have all the answers now, but I serve a God who does. And as I anticipate the trials yet to come my way, I will remember the words I once heard when faced with the unknowns, I look to a God who is known. And you got to be a Christian for a while. Go through a, a few trials before you can talk like Paul talks. After he was shipwrecked, after he'd been run out of town by a mob, after he had received 40 lashes minus one, after he had been left hungry and naked and in threat of the sword, after he'd been kidnapped and after he'd been stoned, Paul said, despite all of this, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He says this, maybe you remember it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You cannot do it in your own strength. You need the Lord's strength because your strength is going to run out and it's going to wear out. Peter said, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and do it with respect. If somebody wants to argue with you about the goodness of God, you tell them, look at my life. Let me tell you where I came from. Let me tell you about a God who has done miraculous things for me. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. You don't have to try and convince me of any carnal opinion. For I am already convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Friends, this is spiritual warfare. We have got to be dressed in the full armor of God. It's an intentional decision. Before you pick out what you're going to wear to school or where to work, put on the full armor of God. 
And the devil wants nothing more than to build strongholds and to set up residence in your heart and mind and in our minds as well. And because we are at, by nature a very rebellious peacher, pe uh, peacher, people, we want to be in control of our lives. And so we push back against the will of God. We push back against his goodness and his mercy. And when we continue to rebel, we open up ourselves to demonic strongholds. Well, let me just be very real right now. In Matthew 12, 42, we read what the word says. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless spaces seeking rest, and it does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, he finds the house unoccupied, swept, and put in order. And then it goes and now takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and they live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it shall also be with this evil generation. And so instead of replacing something that we've swept out with something good, the enemy comes with friends and fortifies and builds strongholds stronger than ever before. And we become more stubborn and we become more prideful, and we become more carnal and more hard-hearted because we have not allowed God to replace our carnal, sinful nature with his righteous nature by the power of the gospel. This is why prayer becomes our first response and not our last resort. Fervent and effective prayer is our most powerful weapon against the enemy. We must cover our families in prayer. I probably should have just said that first thing this morning, just walk off the stage. Cover your families in prayer. Daily, fervent prayer. That the enemy would have no power or authority to build any strongholds in the minds and hearts of our children. Dress yourself in the full armor of God because we as believers have the power of the gospel and the word of our testimony. Sometimes pastors do a great job of presenting the word, but they fall short in giving relevant application. So you ask yourself, well, I've heard what you said, pastor, but what do I do with what you told me now? So let me, before we go today, give you a few suggestions when facing someone that wants to challenge you on your faith because we need to be ready in season and out of season. So let me just give you a 10 quick list of what we can do as a church, as believers, to make sure that we keep ourselves holy and pure in the face of people that want to argue about our faith. Number one, pray before engaging in any debates or conversation. Don't answer, don't type, don't do anything, don't text, don't send anything until you have prayed over the conversation and what you'll say. Secondly, know the word of God and keep it in context. More harm is done when Christians misuse the word of God when they're building their own defense. Number three, speak the truth in love and do not get offended when the truth that you've spoken is not taken well. Number four, share your story. You don't have to use fancy words. Just be honest, be real, be genuine. Number five, know when to walk away and know when to shut it down. Remember, you have the power to log off, you have the power to hang up, you have the power to unfollow, you have the, follow, the power to end the conversation. Number six, did I mention pray? Number seven, know that you or your message may get rejected. But do not allow the enemy to build strongholds of bitterness, anger, or resentment in your heart. Number eight, this could be the toughest one, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Those aren't my words, I wish they were. That's from the Lord. Number nine, trust God with the results. Only he can soften hearts. And number 10, rejoice and be glad that your name is written down 
in heaven. This is a very touch-and-go, scary world which we live in right now, driven by social media that wants to scare us to death. I'm trying to tell you, there's a way that we can keep ourselves pure and holy and represent the Lord and his church well. These are just ten simple steps. Pray. Ask God for discernment. Be bold in what you say, but speak the truth in love. At the very end of the day, even if it goes south, you still can walk away with a smile because your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life somewhere in heaven. This is not our home, folks. We are just passing through. But we're going someplace. And I can't wait to get there. And the day of me going there is coming sooner and sooner than later. And I, I want to be among those pastors who can say, Lord, I want to present to you the Rochester Nazarene Church, a, a church without spot or wrinkle. Everybody's here. We're all accounted for. We've been working diligently, and we've been waiting for you to come. I've got some people waiting for me on the other side. And I, the scripture tells us that even now they're cheering for me and you. They've joined the Abrahams and the Isaacs and the John the Baptist, and they're in the crowd cheering for us to finish this race well. And I want to remind you, this race is a good, it's a good fight. It's a good fight of faith. And the reward is nothing temporal. The reward is Christ himself. We're going to receive a crown one day. And I don't know about you, but there's a few words I really want to hear. And it starts with, well done. Good and faithful servant. Father, this morning, I'm just so thankful for your word. Where would we be? Without the word of God, that has power unto salvation for anyone who would believe. And through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you have given us power and authority to break down strongholds, to demolish satanic arguments, to take every ca a thought captive and held under the obedience of Jesus Christ. What a life you've given us. God, I pray that we would never settle for second best or settle for discouragement and despair, but realize it's a season of our life that we go through, but we never walk through these valleys alone. You are always with us. You have not left us as orphans. You have not abandoned us on our own. You have not left us. You will not leave us or forsake us. God, you are always with us. And so with that power and authority, we can walk forward into the future and into the unknown, knowing that you will always be with us. And we celebrate your goodness this morning. God, I pray that you would inspire and build up this congregation. Give us a passion to reach the lost and remind us of the authority that you have given us, that everywhere we put our feet, we are claiming property under the authority of God for the kingdom of God. So bless each person, I pray. Multiply and anoint their ministry. Let them be shining beacons in this dark world and a great walking testimony of what God can do. And we celebrate your goodness again this morning. As we have our eyes on heaven, we just want to tell you now in this moment how much we really do love you. And I pray these things in the strong name of Jesus and his church said, amen. Amen. God, God bless you. Shake hands with somebody this morning. You are dismissed.